right as everyone comes in and finds their seats. If you will be turning your psalm books to number 131. 131. Larry's going to be leading us in that song. And then we've asked Brother Willard if he would lead us in a word of prayer. Face to face with Christ my Savior. audio and we have video and we got a thumbs up and ready to go. I want to thank each and every one of you for being or staying after services to be in our part of our Bible class. I uh, appreciate uh, your desire to study God's word further as well. I want to thank those who are uh, watching us via Facebook or YouTube and uh, appreciate your interest in the Bible. I want to remind uh, those of you who are at home, we are meeting here at the building. If you are able and uh, uh, you are not been affected by the pandemic and have opportunity, we encourage everyone to be here to worship with us and to study God's Word. So, we are studying from 1 Peter. Uh, we're still in the first chapter, and we are prepared to start with verse 18. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. And I'm going to read um, this out of the way a little bit. Um, still doing it. Um, so I'm going to read from 18 through verse 20. Just move it here in the middle, maybe that will help. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Again, as we've talked, as we've studied First Peter here for a couple of weeks, we've talked about uh, the group of people that are receiving this letter are most likely both Jews and Gentiles, 
And so this particular portion here is really uh, speaking to as much to the, to the Jews, uh, but the Gentiles probably knew enough about the Jewish, the, uh, the Jewish faith. They knew about the God of Israel. And so it starts off the verse there that we are redeemed. He's speaking to the crowd. So what does redeemed mean? Bought back. Thank you. Bought back. If you will, a couple of verses just to support that and to make sure we understand the importance of that. Turn over to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came to be ministered unto, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So part of you know being bought back was that ransom that Christ gave for us. Keep going forward back toward 1 Peter, stop at 1 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 6. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. We're going to have you jump around in your Bibles just a little bit here this morning as we get started. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Again, just reinforcing that word redeemed there. Uh, and uh, a couple more. 1 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 5, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men and the man Christ Jesus. And again, that redeeming portion is Christ is our mediator as well. Last one I'm going to have you search through real quickly is Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is, a, who is a, the faith witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So the word redeemed, you know, being bought by, being ransomed by, and I want to make sure we emphasize that because, again, the audience... Of the, this letter originally, of course, we're the audience today. But the original audience, the people receiving this, are a mixed group of people, both Jews and Gentiles, who are fairly new Christians. They have not obeyed the gospel very much further back in time. And they're scattered abroad. They're not at home anymore. Uh, those who were Christians were, become, were being persecuted. And so now they have left the area of what is today uh, Israel and gone into, again, the country that today is Turkey. So they've gone quite a ways from home. So, you know, in the verse there, we're paid for, uh, you know, not by silver or gold or anything earthly, nothing that is corruptible. And so, you know, our descendants, the times at the first century church, they traded and bartered and eventually created currency. There was currency at the time of Christ you know, to pay for things that they did not possess. None of these things, then, now, or in the future, are going to be able to be exchanged for your soul. None of those things. We often hear phrases, uh, sometimes uh, of selling our souls to the devil, or things like that. It's not possible. You can give your soul to the devil, but you can't sell it. There is nothing. That, it, it, in, in Christ redeemed Himself. He ransomed Himself. He offered Himself on the cross on the cross at Calvary you know, for us before we were even born, before we were even known. And so we have to keep that in mind. And that's again, that's Peter is trying to get that message to them. Let me ask this. I'm going to right here for those of you who've been with us, especially. Why is Peter taking? what is probably the first couple of paragraphs at least, maybe three paragraphs, and he's really emphasizing, he's taking, these are new Christians. They have been 
They've been converted. They've been baptized probably sometime maybe within just the last year or two, if maybe even shorter time. Why is he emphasizing that? Any thoughts to that? Keep in mind they're being persecuted. They're, they're scattered abroad. They're gone. They're away from where their home, their homeland, if you will, most of which probably will never see their homes again. This is where they're at now is going to be their home. This is where they're going to spend the rest of their lives. Why do you think uh, Peter here, I'm sorry, is really trying to stress this point? Any ideas? He's trying to drive it home. He's teaching them endurance too. Thank you. That's 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 right. But he's trying to because they're going to have to go through this persecution. And then here's the other part of that too, just to add to that. They're going into a land, they're going into an area where the gospel may or may not have been preached very much yet. Um, Paul, through his missionary journeys, Peter is even coming up through that area at times, but they're being scattered. Uh, they're, not, they're not going necessarily to uh, the center of these Roman provinces because that's where the persecution is happening. So they're probably scattered out in different areas across, and to some people who've never heard of Christ yet. And so they need to be, and we need to be, strong in our own faith, and strong in our own belief, and understand you know, the sacrifice that Jesus did make for us, so that we can teach others. That endurance, that pleasing to God, goes along with it, if we're going to uh, be able to do that for others. Um, and again, you know, none of these things, there's nothing that we can exchange for our soul. Christ has bought our soul for, it, for, it, for us. So let's keep going. Verse 19 here. Um, we'll read that first part again. But with the precious blood of Christ, uh, you know, the blood of Christ uh, was the only thing that could have redeemed us. Um, it was without blemish. It was without, uh, without spot. So how does this correlate with um, Old Testament times. What were the Jews of the Old Testament required? A lamb without blemish. Well, if they didn't have a lamb, or get a pigeon or whatever, whatever it was, it was supposed to be, it, whatever, whatever they had. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, let's, if you were a cattle farmer, maybe it was your, you know, the, the best cow, the cow, the calf without blemish. Um, what if you were um, a carpenter? Uh, or what if you were a bricklayer? Did you offer a brick? The best one. <laughs> Joe said the best one. You could pay. That's where I was going. You, could, you know, you could, you know, the earnings you had. Again, these things had to be, um, you know, their sacrifice had to be uh, without blemish, and Christ uh, certainly was that. So, how about the um, how about those of the Gentiles who may have been worshiping some pagan god or had some pagan ritual? How how did they view? How do you think they may have viewed this? Did did a lot of pagan rituals also offer some type of sacrifice? They did, and uh, Paul even speaks to uh, in some of his teachings about some of the pagan gods and making sacrifices to those things. And so, you know, they would have had an appreciation for that. Would have, they would have been able to at least understand that. So the sacrifice was the best. You know, even though some of these people were not Jews, they could relate to that sacrifice of God's Son being pure and undefiled and without blemish. Okay, let's keep going. Let's go to verse 20 here. And again, um, who barely... Uh, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times. So Christ was known to be the sacrifice even before the world was formed. And that very first part of that verse right there, verse 20, you know, he, he's telling us before, why is that important? Why is that important for us to know? You know, if we look back to the first uh, First chapter of John 
talks about Christ being there as the Word and being there when the world was formed. Why is that important for us to know? Thank you. Brother Tim was saying, for those who couldn't hear, you know, the Old Testament really didn't have a fulfilled plan of redemption. You just really were rolling your sins forward. And so, um, you know, the plan of salvation brought those things together. You know, some people today will try to suggest to us that the patriarchal age, you know, prior to the Mosaic age, you know, starts out with Adam and Eve and progresses forward. We go through the Noah, you know, the world is cleansed once again with Noah, and things just continue to go bad. And so people will look at the Bible, and people who really view the Bible more as a history book than an inspired word, and say, well, you know, God just didn't quite figure that one out right. And so he created the Mosaic Age. And they'll use this thought process, if you will, to try to show some imperfect, something imperfect in God. So it, it's, it's very crucial that we understand that, you know, as well as, you know, the Mosaic Age, you know, they'll say, you know, things didn't work out well there. You know, the Jews weren't living up, uh, they didn't really, but if you go back through, and you go back through each one of these, uh, and you read the Old Testament, you see where there is the prophecy of Jesus to come. It doesn't spell it out, complete black and white, and again, as we mentioned last week in talking about some of the prophets, they may or may not completely understood the, everything that God was sharing with them. They were repeating what God was sharing with them, but they may or may not completely have understood. And it was also very easy for some people to add to those. Do we have people who want to add to God's word today? And take away too. Thank you, Brother Larry. So certainly they do. And so we have to be careful that we're following God's word. All these things were prophesied and they were fulfilled for our sake. So let's now, let's take verses 21. Let's take uh, verse 21 through 23. Who by him uh, do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and the unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So for those of us that are believers in Christ, if we believe in something, if we believe in the inspired word, and we are converted and we, excuse me, and we obey the gospel, what are we supposed to do from there? If I know this is the perfect plan, if I know this is, this is what I need, you know, I need to read what's in this book, and, I've start, and I'm reading this book, and I've studied this book, and I, so what's the next step? I've read it, I know it, I have to follow it, right? I have to, do, have to abide by it, okay? And so that's what he's telling, we have to live it. We have to live, you know, each step. And again, I'm going to go back, I'm going to keep going back to this point, because I think it really applies to us today, too. Are we persecuted today? Sure. Maybe not to the extent that Christians were, you know, at this point where in, in, in some cases their uh, lives were in jeopardy and sometimes their lives were taken. But we are persecuted for our beliefs today. Just uh, listen to the news or turn on the TV or read the newspaper. You will see things in there where people are, uh, are, will take um, the opportunity to try to discredit the Bible, uh, to the extent that they they believe that there is no God. So, faith and hope in God are, are both the purpose and the result of Christ's resurrection and ascension. That that pure sacrifice that we talked about just a few moments ago, and then His ascension, uh, His resurrection first, and then His ascension back into heaven. And so, if we believe in something, do we follow it? If you don't believe it, 
Maybe you think you do, maybe you hope you do, but if you don't really believe it, um, do you follow it always? No, you don't. And so um, we live in a country, you know, we refer to our government as a democracy. You know, it's a form of government here we have in the United States. Um, so if we, do we believe in the democracy? Do you believe? Maybe that's a good question I should ask all of us. Maybe it's somewhat questionable for us today. But do we believe in the fundamentals? Let me say it that way. Do we believe in the fundamentals for the people, right? Okay. So if we follow that, if we believe in that, then we'll follow the laws, right? Speed limit says 55, we're going to do 55, right? Okay. So maybe not all the laws. Okay. But we are going to follow the laws of the land. Um, what happens if you don't pay your income tax? Unless you're very good at keep moving, you're found eventually, right? Um, so uh, some people maybe try to keep, you know. But let me take you in a different direction here. You know, we, we, we have pride in our freedom, we, you know, paying our taxes, et cetera. But if someone attacks us as a country, and they attack us because of our democracy, our freedoms that we have. How does that make us feel? Mad? What else? It pushes us together, doesn't it? So what happened on 9-11? I know the men, there were men that were from another country who followed a radical, uh, false teacher, um, trained, planned, and put together and flew uh, three airplanes, two in the two towers at the World Trade Center and one into the Pentagon. One other one unsuccessfully, due to some uh, very brave people, uh, crashed into a, a field in Pennsylvania. But what was their purpose? What were they trying to do? destroy our faith and what else our freedom and our freedom by what by doing so that we're not we're not untouchable right we're when we hear about conflicts and things in the Middle East and things like that those things are happening in those countries we don't hear about those things happening here when World War II started, what was the real big driver that drove us, at least into the Asian uh, area? What was the one big thing that happened on December 7th? Pardon? Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. Some of you who are maybe follow your history well enough, you know, during most of World War II, Japan felt untouchable. And they were untouchable, at least from us. Uh, not until well halfway through the war, maybe a little bit further, were we able to get ships close enough that we could put planes over the top of Japan. Uh, some, of the, some of the men that did that did not make it back. That was called Doolittle's Raid. If some of those who you follow history uh, may recall that. Uh, but what was the decisive thing that the Japanese encountered that they realized that they were no longer untouchable. We dropped two atom bombs on them. Uh, and so, you know, the Japanese immediately, you know, recognized that. And so, Christians that Peter is writing to need to be banded together, as Brother Ronnie was saying. They need to be pulled together. And that is quite often what happens when someone attacks our way of life, our government, our country, and it especially should be how we pull together when people attack our faith. You know, today, again, we, we live in a great country. We have all these freedoms. We have the freedom to be in this building today to worship what we want to teach God's word. And we should never, ever take that for granted because there are so many places in the world that we, this would not be possible, at least not to this extent. Maybe four or five or ten of us might be able to sneak off into a building somewhere and have some type of worship service. But to, to this extent, uh, this would not be able to happen. 
if one day our government tells us that there's a portion of this book that we cannot teach anymore. And if we do, the doors of the building will be padlocked and we will not be allowed back in our building. What are we going to do? I hope y'all meet me in the parking lot. You'll meet under a tree or something. You know, I hope that day doesn't come. But um, unfortunately in our country, there are a few places already that um, if God's word specifically talking about the sin of homosexuality, there are a few places already in our country that have laws on the book that that's considered hate speech. That's a federal law. And so, um, you know, that's very serious. And so that's something we have to continue to think about, to pray about, and think as far as, far as our per, uh, persecution is concerned. So God's law, going back to verse 21 here, God's law is the perfect law. It's his requirements of us. It's his expectations. And I'll leave you with the question, do we live it? It's up to each one of us, right? Today, I used the speed limit example for a few minutes, few minutes ago, you know, the speed limit being 55. Maybe we all drive 55. Maybe some of us drive 56, 57. Maybe some of us drive 54. I don't know. Uh, maybe some of us do 65 and 70, you know, when it says 55. Uh, but you don't get caught because you got to wait for those friendly guys with the blue lights, right, Bruce, to find to figure you out. And so, uh, but when we answer to God through His law, God is on them. He's He's going to know everything, and so we can't hide anything, you know, secret to ourselves. We often refer to as sins of omission or, or sins of commission, things that we omit or things that we've done. So. All right, let's keep going to verse 22. Uh, again, Paul emphasizing here being purified their souls by obeying the truth. We have to, we must realize about being cleansed, you know, overcoming baptism. Um, you know, in the mission field, in a lot of countries, we often see um, the, the gospel is obeyed to, and, and those individuals are so eager to get into the water for baptism. They're so eager to, to move forward with that and to study. And so, you know, we have to remember the importance of that. Again, that's something that is attacked in our country today, uh, you know, as to the need to or whatever. But the key thing of that verse there, he starts off again, 22, you know, or I should say at the end of it there, the unfeigned love of the brethren, that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Why is it important for these people and us today to love each other? We need each other, right? We need each other. We need to be able to help and support each other. We need the support of others. You know, um, you know right now the Cunningham family uh, really needs prayers. Uh, kind words, cards, anything like that that can help out. Uh, the Flat family, and Jeff and losing his father. And others, I know some of you who have family members who are sick or ill, and they, you know, they have needs, and we need to be able to comfort one another. You know, sometimes just a kind word, you know, just you know, sharing it. You know that you know I went through this, or I've done this, or my heart has never gone through this. You know, but just having a kind, you know, and just someone just knowing that you care. And so I want a couple of things, uh, if you will. Pull, Take your Bibles and go over to John chapter 13. I'm going to pull out a few verses. I'm not going to have you jump around too much here. I'm just going <coughs> to, excuse me, I'm just going to right here in chapter 13, a few, a few chapters right in here. Chapter John chapter 13, verse 34. Some of these are going to be very familiar to you. New commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and you also love one another. Now I turn just a couple of pages probably in your Bible to chapter 15, verse 12. Chapter 15, again, John chapter 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love one another. I have loved you. Keep going about five verses down, verse 17. These things I command you that you love one another. Do you think Jesus is trying to emphasize something here? Long before any persecution begins, 
long before there are, there are people at this point who have been converted, who have become um, a member of Christ, a body of Christ. And so but he's already starting to emphasize that. The last one I want you to take a look at is one of Christ's prayers. Look over at chapter 7, John chapter 17 and verses 20 through 26. And um, you know, we t- and this is the Lord's prayer for the church. Now, this is a different example. There is another example in, uh, in the Gospels where that um, uh, Jesus is teaching his disciples and the apostles how to pray. But this is, this is his prayer for the church. So uh, John chapter 17, 20 through 26. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou art Father in me, and I in thee, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that thou may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, and and thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. He is over and over again reporting, you and me, I and them, us together. He is pushing that, that thought there in that prayer for the church there. And, and, and the emphasis is the love that they have to have for one another. What does love, you know, when, when we love each other, um, when we're all together, uh, if you put all of us in a room together and we all had to spend six months together, we couldn't leave this room for six months. You think we, some of us might get on each other's nerves just a little bit? Wouldn't take that long. <laughs> Leonard stepped up to be the first one, I think. So, um, I understand. I understand. That's where we were talking about. So, um, no, but um, you know, that's the unique thing and the wonderful thing God made about us. We're all unique. We're all different. If he made us all the same, wouldn't we be just a boring bunch of people? If we all had the same likes and the same, you know, we would have no initiative, we would have no nothing. And so, you know, in God's creation in us. But at the same time, there are different attributes and strengths and weaknesses and characteristics that each one of us have that might annoy the other sometimes. So how do we overcome that? With love. That's why he's emphasizing that there. We have to love one another and really appreciate, uh, you know, one another. Um, First John four seven eight and nine. Um, First John four, chapter four <laughs> verses seven eight and nine. Right? Is that what you were referring? Four seven eight and nine. There you go. Thank you. And so, you know, John really goes into a lot of emphasis in there to the to the love of Christ. And the love that we're supposed to have for each other, you know. And so again, uh, these people being persecuted, they got to have love for each other, just like we do. Uh, you know, again, we have to do the same thing. Uh, you know, there's people that I know that you work with. There's people I work with. There's people that we interact all the time, uh, even outside the church. And we have to love them too. We have to have a Christ-like love, and that's what he's telling them there too, because that way I can be able to have an opportunity to convert someone. If you're very rude or you treat someone unfairly or you just treat them unchristian like it or you just you just pick something out of the Bible if you want to, what opportunity are you going to have to ever preach the gospel? Well, you could preach the gospel to them. Are they going to listen? 
probably not. If you're not a good example, if you're not especially you know, showing love, you know, then it's going to be really hard for you to teach that person once they've seen your example of not being Christ-like. And that's really you know, the message here again that, that Peter is trying to get to them. Let's keep going to verse 23. Begotten again. You know, this is calling back to that previous verse, you know, being born again through baptism. He's talking about corruptible seed here. That's the human birth. Uh, and then he's talking about the incorruptible seed, and that's the rebirth. That's the salvation. That's the conversion you know, through baptism, which comes through the world. I want to hit these last two verses of chapter 1 here. Let me flip back over to 1 Peter. 24 and 25, and keep in mind, this is a quotation, or at least in part, from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 and 8. It says, For all flesh is as grass, all the glory of man as the flower of, of grass, the grass withereth, and the flower therefore fadeth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word with, with which by the gospel is preached unto you. So life here on earth is very brief. Um, it's... Uh, you know, James will tell us it's like a vapor. Uh, and so, you know, if we're blessed with, um, you know, some 80 years, might be the average life expectancy, um, you know, some uh, have less, some have more. Uh, but uh, uh, depending on where you're at at your stage in life today, most of us, as we get closer to that 80-year-old uh, mark or whatever mark you want to think that's... Uh, uh, maybe close to the end of life, we think it went by way too fast, way too fast. You know, when you're much younger, you know, it seems like you just can't, I can't get there fast enough. I can't be 16 fast enough so I can drive. I can't be 18 fast enough so I can do this. Get out of school, get a job, do whatever. You know, I, you know, I just can't get old enough fast enough. And then somewhere right around 30, 35, it's like, wow, I'm getting old. And so, you know, we start and then it just seems like it's kind of downhill from there sometimes. You know, so, you know, we have to think about that, you know, whatever glory that we have, and this is what the verse is trying, to, two verses, and Isaiah was doing the same thing, Peter's using the verse here too. Whatever glory that man may enjoy, whether it's political, financial, social, or whatever, you know, cannot last long. So, you know, there's hundreds of corporations, institutions, governments, and individuals who have prospered immensely, who but they're disappeared without a trace today. Right? Now I'm looking around in this audience, and this is probably a really poor analogy, but how do you remember who Howard Hughes was? Honestly. How many of you really know who remember who Howard Hughes was? I see a few hands going up. Howard Hughes. Do you remember who Howard Hughes was? The Spruce Goose, okay, that's how some people remember Howard, Howard Hughes. Um, Howard Hughes was a very uh, uh, um, wealthy man in his lifetime. Uh, he was a, a very good entrepreneur. He was a pilot. Uh, he was an engineer, a designer. As Brother Larry was pointing out, uh, one of his, you know, some people will call it a failure, but some, a lot of people will call it a success, too. He uh, managed to build, a, unfortunately, at the end of World War II, after it was over with, built a plane to be able to transport troops, and a, a, the, one of the largest planes at the time. And uh, it was built out of spruce, and it was called the Spruce Goose. And he did get it to fly. It flew for about 10 minutes at about six feet off the ground, and now it sits in the Smithsonian. Okay? How many of you knew about the Spruce Goose? That, that might even be a better one. Of course, I know Joe went over here. He probably had to teach it in class one day sometime in the past. But my point to that is, is that unless you watch the movie, if you're young enough, if you watched the movie a few years ago that Leonardo DiCaprio uh, portrayed Howard Hughes, you probably really didn't know that much about Howard Hughes. He didn't know, you know he's gone in history. Even though at his time, during his generation, during his life, he was highly recognized. He was the Bill Gates, if you will. He was the, uh, um, who's the gentleman that oversees Berkshire Hathaway today? Um, just lost his name. One of the wealthiest men in the world. You know, that's how he was recognized. You know, so in corporations, here's another one.
And he was no relation to me, by the way, just so you all know. He, at least he didn't leave me any money, I can tell you that. So, but no, Joe was making the point at the end of his life was uh, very disturbing, uh, you know, with mental illness and issues that he had with um, uh, fear of disease and things like that, and pretty much well left, the, left this earth and pretty much being a recluse. And so um, there's another, I'll just, you know, we'll step away from people for just a moment. Um, um, IBM. How many of you remember the company IBM? I should say remember because they're still in a company called IBM. There was a time where that was one of the wealthiest, largest corporations in the United States. It's not anymore. It's Microsoft, okay? Let's go back to people again. Steve Jobs. I'm going to test some of the people who are a little bit younger. Uh, they know who Steve Jobs is. The rest of us may not know who. Uh, how many of I don't have mine in my pocket. How many of you carry an Apple phone with you? That's Steve Jobs. He created Apple. Um, he was a very wealthy man. Um, he passed away, Caleb helped me out, four years ago? Longer than that? 2014, 2014, so six years ago. All the different things that he was able to do in his mind and be able to create. Um, for those of you who have ever you know, read about him, um, and then for those of you, there was a movie a few years about him, but things that you've ever read about him, he was incredibly demanding. He, was inc he pushed people to the end. He pushed them to anger, but he pushed them to success, too. And even his own children, he would push and, and, and in most cases, pushed his children completely out of his life. And so he would see things, and he would be able to think about it. Some of you remember what was called a Sony Walkman. And you would put a cassette into it, and you'd play, you'd put your headphones on, and you'd walk around and listen to your Sony. You know, and he was one of the first pre person, people to look at that and think, you can only carry about 30 songs with you. I'm going incre to create something that will carry thousands of songs. I mean, that's eventually where you have your iPhones today. Uh, it came from that first device. Where is he at today? Do we talk about Steve? No, my point to all that is, is that all of us, no matter what our fame or fortune or whatever, you know, we are all going to pass from this life. Whether we're poor or rich or famous or whatever, I promise you, you will be forgotten. Okay? I will be forgotten. I fully anticipate it. Um, Brother Lee Flat, Tony will oft, has often said, uh, told him one time, said, if you don't think you can be replaced, just die. You will be replaced somehow, some way, whatever your task, whatever you were doing. And so we have to keep thinking about our eternal home. We have to keep thinking. You know, sometimes especially as um, um, people get to a, a certain point in their life with illness or disease, and, uh, you know, there, there's uh, not much time left. And we, we sometimes have to make decisions of quality over quantity. You know, their time on this earth is, is close. And so we have to make those decisions, uh, you know, for the quality of life versus the amount of life. Uh, and so those are very, very difficult decisions. But we have to make those. Those are what are, are most important to us. And certainly what the absolute most important is where do we spend eternity? Where, where are we going to do that? And that, again, that's his, that's his emphasis here. Um, you know, Christ fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies. Uh, he recognized by God as his son. And Peter was a witness to these things. We talked about this as Peter introducing himself. This is where Peter is reinforcing that one more time, that I was with Jesus. I can attest to that. And we have his letter there to prove that. All right, we're going to step off into chapter 2. I'm not going to get very far. So we only have just a couple of minutes of our time left. In the first 10 verses of chapter 2, uh, Peter is going to stress the duties of the church. He's going to speak to them in terms as if they're the new Israel of God. They're the new, cho we are the new chosen people, Okay. So they have to exhibit their lives worthy of the calling to the gospel. And then verses 11 through 25, 
he's going to give them a number of admonitions about being Christians and their obligations of living in the world and the society that, that we live in too as, as today. So let's take, I think we might be able to get at least verse, I'll read verses 1, 2, and 3. We might get be able to talk about verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. And uh, Tony used this verse last Sunday as he was in his lesson. If so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And so putting away, therefore, the Greek word there really is, or I should say, wherefore, laying aside. The Greek word there means basically the thought is stripping away one's clothing, just pulling that away. And so his meaning there is to denounce and turn away from all these wicked things. It would be very easy as these people, again, are gone into a far country, they're scattered abroad, they're, they're being you know, tempted, they're being persecuted, to just give up and just go enjoy whatever the world provided for them, whatever uh, sins or things that were there. But, you know, Peter is admonishing them to not do that. Guile is the deceitfulness. It's lying and false speech. Um, as newborn babes, right? As we enter into this world, Brother Joe's comment is it's interesting that he's going to come back into verse 2 talking about his newborn babes so that everybody was able to hear that. Um, the, hip the hypocrisies, pretending to be what, want, what we know we're not. I'm going to say that one more time. Being a hypocrite is pretending to be what we know we're not. Okay? Uh, envies, these are jealousy, these are springs from jealousy, you know, having malice in our hearts that are displeasing uh, with beauty or achievement or virtue that others may have. And so we have to be careful. And uh, I think our time is up, so we'll, we'll really pick up here at the end of verse 1 and start from there next Sunday. Thanks.